All right, everyone. It's another Q&A with Alan and Marshall. I'm Marshall Atkinson. I'm Alan Howe with Easy Way Systems. And welcome to our show. It's Friday. It's the end of a huge week. I had um, a lot of fun this week talking with folks and helping them out. And Alan, you were traveling. Where did you go? I've been gone the last two weeks. So two weeks. Because you were gone last week. I, had I was gone day. last week, and Allie really did a great job filling in for me. Job. So thank you, Allie. And not to you. mention, her, her on camera makes us both look better. You know, we're here. Well, because she looks better than both She does. Us. Come on. So, <laughs> but yeah, so I've been traveling, and I'm going to be gone next week. I was in Arizona uh, a week ago. I was in Columbus, Ohio. The first part of this week had to drive home Thursday or Wednesday night for a big appointment in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Just been good. Marshall, things are really starting to open up in the industry. People oh, are I know they are. Busy, and it's really starting to get fun again. I think there's some optimism and we can see some light at the end of the tunnel. So right. still be safe, still be smart, get vaccinated. I got next week shot number two for me. Yeah, I think our, we're, getting, we're getting my shot number two next week also. Jody was talking about that. That's my yeah. right. So, so um, let's lot, get lot going. We got a lot to talk about today. Yeah. Um, cool. I think it's going to be a really good show. So here's what we want you guys to do. I, I see everybody saying good morning. So please do that. Please say good morning. But we need you to do us a favor. We need you to, one – share that you're watching. So there's a yeah. share button, click the share, say, Hey, I'm watching the show. You should join in. Please do us a favor and share. That yep. really helps us out. The next thing is this is a Q and a show, which the Q is the most important thing. That's you. That's for you. Yep. You're supposed to ask questions. <laughs> Right. And it doesn't have to be in any of the topics we have up. You're right. We just do the topics just to have a place to go, right? But if you've got some crazy thing you're working on or you've got a problem or yeah. you just don't – something's weird and you just don't know what to do, put it in the comments and let us help you. That's what we're here for, okay? Yep, absolutely. Um, I had – I don't know about you. I mean, I have been – <laughs> Did you see Dave Edgar's just posted? I didn't notice that. <laughs> it's you about... guys have matching glasses. No, it, well, I don't, do I? Uh, well, I don't know. But these are the new Q&A glasses. They'll be on our merch page. Everybody needs to get some. Well, they're black frames. Mine are, uh, who makes your frames? Mine are Oakley frames. I don't remember on these. Uh, these are Ray-Ban. Well, they're, uh, I got Oakley and Ray-Ban. It's close. Yep. These are Ray-Ban, and um, yeah, and my uh, sunglasses are Ray-Ban also. Yeah. So, yeah, great great observation, Dave. I don't yeah, know. I have, I have Ray-Ban sunglasses, the mm -hmm. same pair of sunglasses I've worn for almost 30 years. Uh, and they're back in style now. That's awesome. They never left style. They're, it's Marshall style. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I just got a, a pair of prescription sunglasses just before the first of the year. Yeah. Um, you know, I had to use um, money in my uh, health savings account. And so, yeah. Yeah, good, good. So, so let's say good morning to everyone. So Hurley Molds is here. Good morning. Good morning, Hurley. Keisa's here. Good morning, hey, Keisa. Uh, Sean's here. Hey, Always. Sean. Hey, by the way, I liked uh, the fact that Adam, your guy Adam, got you mentioned in the uh, promo magazine. Good job with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cindy says, good morning. Good morning from Texas. Jordan is here. Good morning. I just started working with Jordan, uh, as a coach. So good where morning. Where are they out of it? I don't know who they are. Where are they from? Uh, Jordan, where I are you care. from? I think he's from Ohio. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, Jordan. I, I, now I'm embarrassed. I don't know where you're, I can't Jordan, remember. Uh, where, you're where you're from. Um, and then, uh, Peter says, no, he's in California. I don't know. I talked to too many people. It's in my <laughs> brains messed up this morning. Peter's here. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Peter. He's in Minnesota. Got it. Right. I just saw that. All right. Yeah. Dave Eggers is here. Good morning. Well, hi, Marshall, at least. You know, that's what you Hi, Marshall, at least. That's what, that, because he's one of my distributors. He's poking fun at me. Oh, he he's says, a I'm a gentleman and you're not, right? He's a former distributor as of now. Okay, no, well, he 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 I couldn't, I couldn't uh, last without you, bud. Josh so. says, good morning. Yep. And then uh, uh, Kim says, good morning from Oklahoma. Hey, Kim, how you doing? Good seeing you. All right, so 
Uh, you want to get to the first topic? Do it. All right. You ready? Go. Um, here's my first topic. Are you trying to teach a pig to whistle? <laughs> so It's a very hard thing to do. It, it, pigs don't whistle and you're, they're never going to learn. They and then what do you them. do with that pig? Right. Yeah, you eat them. Yeah. You eat them. So the reason I wanted to uh, talk about this this morning is I have more than one coaching client this week who are either had severe employee problems or yep. they're terminating employees. And so the reason I wanted to put this up here today is because I think a lot of times we try to get our crews, our staff, our team to do the things that we want them to do. And it's like trying to teach a pig to whistle. Yep. They're just not going to get it. Right. Yep. And you're still paying them. You're still trying to make them work. You're still hoping, crossing your fingers that they're finally going to get it. It's like teaching a pig to whistle, right? So sooner or later, you're yeah. going to have to make a decision and terminate them, right? So yeah. the reason I wanted to put this out there today is, is right now, right? I feel right around the corner is victory, <laughs> right? I agree. We know that orders are they're going to explode. And if you're trying – to keep that employee there because you know that you don't want to go through the hassle of hiring somebody, you got to retrain them or whatever, you know, blah, blah, blah. you need to start that process earlier, right? So you can't, it's going to be so much harder to get that new person onboarded when you're 10 times busier than you yeah. are now. So I wanted to throw that out there right now. Who, and I know a lot of people reduce their staff because of COVID and all that kind of stuff. I totally get it. But just make sure the people on your team are really doing the things that you want them to do. You have to be clear about what's going on. You have to make sure you train them. You have to make sure you do everything, all that kind of stuff. But at a certain point, they're just not cutting it. You need to let them go and get uh, somebody new and replace them. That's that's my point with this. What do you think about that, Alan? Well, I think you're spot on. Uh, just like you, uh, some of the people that are your clients or mine, I know who are, they've had to make some hard, tough decisions. And I'm going to speak just from observation. I've never been in that position where I've had to let somebody go. So the, just so no, this is from observation. But normally what happens is it is gone on too long especially now, everybody wants to, you know, it's so hard to find employees are going, they just wait too long. And I was watching when I was driving home Wednesday, the um, Shirt Lab Tribe uh, uh, video from that Nate Lever did from Lever Design. Right, right. Because I was just at Nate's shop. And if you're not part of Tribe, watch, get a, join in and watch that on culture and hiring people. And he talked about don't get into the trap of just going for a warm body. And he actually put numbers that a bad employee, and we're not talking managers, that I think it was seven to eight thousand dollars lost by a bad employee that could be a cancer that is just not there. And you're not doing yourself any favor. So um, yeah, I know there are people. I know it's hard to find people, and it's a hard decision. Nobody wants to have to be the bad guy and let him go, but. Mm -hmm. You can't. If it's just not working out, it's not working out. Yeah, I have terminated uh, a lot of people over the years. You know, I've been doing this thing since 93. So right. yeah. over that period of time, there's been some people, <coughs> excuse me, right. there's been some people who just weren't making it. And I had to like, we had to make a decision. Now, I'm a big believer, right, in mm -hmm. trying to hire competent people people yep. who you can empower, you train them and they just let them loose. That's kind of my management style. I'm hiring you because I want you to do the job. If I have yep. to do your job for you, why do I need you? Yep. That's kind of how I've always done it. Right. And I also know Marshall too. I wonder, you know, you and I were talking about a situation like this, this earlier this week. And my thought was always going, you know, I understand that happens, but how much does the owner, and everything go, you know, we all have blind spots. 
what wasn't communicated. Okay, they go, yep. I go, how much do we have to look back at yourself? You know, when you're saying you're gone, three fingers are pointing back at you where I think everybody needs to look and go, all right, what did I do not well of training these people, communicating yeah. over? There's always two sides to a coin. Oh, um, definitely, definitely. So, and, it, uh, uh, and but uh, there's a certain point. Oh, absolutely. Where you know, it's just you, not you just gotta you just gotta do it. And yeah. unfortunately, we've reached that point with some people. And you have to make the decision and uh, we can get into how to terminate people. But oh, yeah. we have some comments. I just want to sure. get them, get them going. So uh, Ruben's here says, good morning, Ruben. Hi, Ruben. Uh, Shane's here. Good morning, hey. William. Hey, oh, yeah. uh, our good buddy Mark's here. Hey, hey Mark. guys. Talk to Mark. Uh, Greg Kitson's here. Good morning. Always Greg. good. Mr. Kitson. Richard says, good morning. Is it the student or the teacher's responsibility what does supervision mean? And well, that's an interesting point, Richard. And yeah. how I've always led teams is it's my job to make you better. Mm -hmm. It's my job to help you be, help you increase your performance by mm -hmm. teaching you new things or giving you a better tool or per, make sure you have the right time or you're a computer or that press or whatever works. That's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. Your responsibility as an employee is doing the work and get, make and trying with your best effort, right? That kind of a thing. And that's how I always thought about it. But that's an absolute uh, great comment here. Yeah. What does supervision mean? You know, yeah. um, I know uh, managers who think the way to supervise is to yell yeah, and make sure people aren't in the bathroom. That's their version of managing. Yep. <laughs> That's not it for me. That's not it. Um, Peter says, bad employees or lack of training, businesses with clearly defined systems will outperform those that rely on tribal knowledge every time. Exactly, Peter. Great comment. Thank you for sharing that. Daryl said, Daryl, get it on. Hey, Daryl, I want to uh, connect with you. Let's get a call next week. Uh, Mark says, employees are only as good as management allows them to be. Poor management equals poor employees. Every That's time. exactly true, Mark. Uh, I always, and this is the story that I tell a lot, is you remember the Johnny Paycheck song, Take This Job and Shove It? Yep. Right, remember that song? It wasn't about money. No. That Johnny was mad, <laughs> right? No. It's about that idiot boss, right? Yep. And that's the reason why most people quit is because they're Johnny Paycheck, right? It yep. takes this job and shove it. I ain't working here no more. They can't take it one more minute. Yep, absolutely. Right. And I remember talking with somebody who finally quit after years and years and years of working at the shop. Right. I talked to them shortly after that. I couldn't believe they left. And he was telling me that they were crying. This is a guy crying with tears of joy that they <laughs> finally left. And it shouldn't have come to that. They, she should oh, have and they were so happy, right? Yeah. Their next step, they didn't even know what they were going to do, but they oh, finally okay. just couldn't take it anymore. And they're driving their car crying. They were so happy, yeah. right? That means that that place sucked. <laughs> okay. Exactly. So uh, I, I think too, Marshall, you know, um, last week, Allie was talking and she gave an analogy for downtime. And one of it was talent. Hire for talent. You know, where is the hidden talent in your shop? So sometimes right. people are in, in positions where they're just not going to succeed because of them. But where can they succeed in your company? You might want to look at too. Right, right. What are those hidden talents? So. And, hey, and if you've quit a job because of something, I know you probably don't rat them out publicly, but. Right. Share, share that if you want to. We'd love to hear that story. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Peter says you can train skills, but you can't fix a bad attitude or lack of Great motivation. Team. Hire for attitude. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, Great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to what Nate Leber said. Look at when you're uh, interviewing, talk about the culture, talk about what's going on. Make sure it's got to be a good fit from the beginning. If it's not a good fit for everybody, it's not a good fit for anybody. Yeah, I can tell you that I've been fooled 
Yep. You know, I've hired people and I thought, man, this person's really going to just kill it. Right. Yep. And then a couple months in, you're like, man, <laughs> that, that yeah. was wrong. Like I hired a, um, I hired a uh, former Air Force sergeant. Sure. Right. It, it, in a leadership position, because I thought this person was going to be have the discipline. They know how to work with a team. They've got people skills that, you know, the military invested lots of money into training them how to handle groups of people and that kind of stuff. Right. And they couldn't work with people. This, oh. this person couldn't work with people and it caused all types of, it was just, it was a nightmare, right? What's it and they had me fooled. It was a great job interview and uh, first week or two was okay. And then it was just like we leapt off a cliff without a parachute. Yep. And um, and I could, I, I had to, I had to let him go. Right. Do you uh, think, in a situation like that, as a sergeant in the army or in the military, and I've not been in the military or well, it was the Air Force, but yeah, but, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. is it because they're so used to saying, "Here's a directive, don't question it, just go and do"? Well, this, uh, yeah, well, you know, um, I'm not going to get into the reasons with this person, sure. but but it was like, um, you know, it was like my assumption of their leadership skills was wrong based on what they told me. And, and that was what I was trying to get to is like, you know, that was a great job interview and I hired them based on that. And then at the end of the day, the, the pig, the pig just wouldn't whistle, yep. <laughs> you know? So, uh, Oh, Christine's here. Good morning. Christine. Hey, Christine. If you find a star, don't rein them in. Some people get intimidated by managing someone who is really capable. Shutting people down reduces the value they can bring. What a great comment. Perfect. And I saw on Facebook, Christine, that you have a new job. Congratulations. Can you share what you're doing now? Um, Absolutely. I think that's uh, – I'm sorry. I can't remember exactly what you're doing marketing for somebody, but please share what you're doing. That's great. Is it? I thought it was. She was also hired to write for someone. I, that might be what I saw. So yeah, share okay. with us, Christine. Yeah. Um, well, I just saw it this morning when I was like glancing through my feed. So anyway, I think Christine makes a great point on there. If you have people with talent, as a supervisor, as a manager, give them the boundaries. Here it is, and then let them move freely within those boundaries. Let yeah. them fail. Let them succeed, and let them maybe push those boundaries to yeah. do better. And you're not, that's a great point. You're not going to micromanage Larry Bird or Michael Johnson or, uh, Michael you know, uh, Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, excuse me, or any yeah. of those, you know, or name your star athlete. You're, you're yeah. going to, like, teach them some plays. You're going to show them how to work together with a team. You're yeah. going to make them better by tweaking what they do. But people a lot of times have natural skill and ability, and you got to let them run with it. Oh, right? Absolutely. You know, I know a Pat Riley with Magic Johnson and, oh gosh, it's escaping me, Michael Jordan's coach during that time. Um, you know, they said, here's the plays here. You know, I'm with Chicago Bulls, it was that triangle offense. Here it is. And they told the people, but there it is. There's the boundaries. Let's go. And good right. players will rise to that and say, okay, here's how we make it better. Right, right. And then even being a Detroit fan, when – during the playoffs of that 89-90 run with the Pistons, Jordan was killing them for two games. And then they came up with the Jordan rules that, hey, we'll let anybody else beat them, but not Michael Jordan. And they came up with the plays that anytime Michael Jordan had the had the ball, you know, here's what they do. And you, you, you let the team know. They buy into it. You got to trust the leader who's the head coach and give them the uh, mm -hmm. box to go. So, yeah, right. I love sports analogies. Yeah, me too. Well, you know, uh, James says if people hey, bad mouth companies that they used to work for during a job interview, they will be ba bad mouthing your company as well in a very short time. Right. Agreed. And here's what there's a there uh, in a job interview. One of the things you might look for is, is this person humble? Yeah. Right. Do they have a sense of humility? Do they do they talk about what they've learned? And I made this I made this mistake. Here's what I've learned. Yep. Right. And if you're not broadcasting that humility, if you don't talk about and it's like raise your hand and say, Yes, I've made a mistake. Here's what I learned. Like 
uh, you know, that that could show you that maybe that's a, not a good fit for you. So Right. Uh, Christine answered my question. I do. I'm very excited. I'll be the director of marketing and outreach for Apple K Gateway. It's a trade show in the home industry space. Oh, and I'll be writing for Graphics Pro Magazine as well. There you I, go. Very good, Christine. Congratulations. I saw Graphics Pro Magazine, uh, so I didn't want to steal your thunder. I did not know about um, uh, Apple Key uh, Gateway. Congratulations. You'll do great. Yeah. And then Peter says, I've made the mistake of being overly impressed during an interview when I should have asked, why isn't this guy already working somewhere else? Beware the expert job applicant. Ooh, uh, that's a good comment, Peter. Yeah. I love it. You know, I find that when, you know, a lot of people, Marshall, I know you uh, get asked all the time from printers, hey, I need a press operator. Oh, twice a week at least. And it's oh. going up right now, by the way. And my answer is, if they're available, do you really want them? Well, because some people now, right now, are available because the companies are shutting down. So some true. people are available because they no longer have a job because the company doesn't exist. Well, and that's that was, no fault of that printer. But usually, if there's people that are available, it's what kind of baggage they come through. And yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it can be rough. So. Yeah. And uh, my response, by the way, is when people go, hey, I need a press operator. Or I need an embroidery operator is, well, they're already working for you. You just haven't trained them yet. Absolutely. Like you need the to develop. A big there already. Right. You know, in basketball, yep. it's like, who's your sixth man? Right. That's yep. really important. Um, I think I think we need to actually focus more on that in our industry as labor becomes more. I hate to say expensive and valuable in good labor, even more valuable. We need to start looking from within on who you can bring up and start right. looking at the long term. It's always been that, but I think it's becoming more and more, um, you know, needed right now. Is to, right, right. I can't think of the word, but yeah. So uh, Ghost is watching from Sweden. Hey, buddy, how's it going? Yeah, uh, Christine says, never burn your bridges and recognize that you've had a bad experience at a company you, at some level, contributed yeah. to that experience. Always take the high road. That's a great, great comment. Thanks. I appreciate your support. Always. Eric says, Applicate Getaway is a cool event, and they're lucky to get Christine. I agree. Christine's awesome. Yep. Uh, Glad Eric on also. Yeah. Carlos says, I thought today, since it's Good Friday, I was going to have some time to watch the entire show. Guess what is not happening? Busy, busy, busy. What? Guess what is not happening? Busy, busy, not complaining. I will catch up tonight. Good show, guys. Thanks, Carlos. Thanks, Carlos. Carlos is a buddy of mine out of, out of Chicago. So yeah. runs sorry, a sorry shop. my, my in, inability to read. Yeah. <laughs> You're very kind, Eric. Much appreciated. And it's all about the employees. Absolutely. And then Eric says, cross training. Seriously, so many people already have skills that lead into other segments. Embroiders can make great digitizers if they want to do it. Yeah, I heard Eric. Eric the, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I heard Eric uh, say it uh, on a different podcast, him talking, and I listen to Eric whenever I can, that you always have, uh, we were talking about cross, he was talking about cross training, that even having your print operator come in and at least learn basic hooping, basic, uh, you know, cutting away and thread, uh, things like that in the embroidery. Because, man, when you're cross training and you need somebody or it's slow there, they might not be as fast as your other is your normal embroiderer, but hey, they can be uh, still get product out. So uh, cross. Hey, I want to. I want to show something real quick. That's can, you, can is this live? Can you see this? Yes, it's a right. So I'll send this to anybody who wants it. Okay, so this is a skills inventory spreadsheet that I made like forever ago, and it's here's how it works. Is uh, this is all about how you're training? Whoop. This is all about how you're training That's people. That's why he did it on me. I have no skills. Right. So here's the, and you can add your own stuff, right? So here's how to work. You rate them from zero to 10. Zero means they don't know how to do it. 10 right. means they're a rock star and they can teach it. Okay. And then you rate your, you put all your employees across here and you rate them on stuff everybody needs to know. For example, can they read a work order? And you have all your departments, sales, purchasing, art, screen room, ink, press operator, 
press puller, catcher, receiving, shipping, production, management, whatever, right? And then if you, because sometimes we don't know that so-and-so knows how to X, yep. mix ink, trim, embroidery, whatever, right? Because maybe they came from a different shop and you have never asked them. So this is a great way to evaluate where they are on their journey. And if you want to cross train them with purpose on something, mm -hmm. here's where you can identify your needs and you can identify who's going, who's going to do it with a real simple way. And I will happily share this with whoever wants it. Just send me an email uh, and I'll do that. Okay. You know so, what I, too, I don't know if it's on there. I couldn't see it was too small, Marshall, but you know what? Can they see color correctly? How many times I've had people to say, I heard him, he's great, but he's colorblind. Have you ever heard Jeff McHugh's story about the John Deere green? Yes, you told it to me, <laughs> but that's exactly it. Right. And okay. I would have never known that about Jeff McHugh. I mean, he, the guy's a rock star. Right, right. Hey, Charlie's here. Good morning, Charlie. Hey, Good morning. Great. All right, so uh, please leave your comments about that. If you need... If you need uh, that spreadsheet, just email me here at marshall at marshallatkinson.com and I will happily share it with you. Uh, I've used it for years and years and years at two different shops. So right. um, it's, it works great. Um, all right. You ready for question two? Hit us. Situational awareness. Yeah, absolutely. So what are we talking about here, Alan? You got to be aware of what's going on around you, one in your shop, in the market, because now that we're getting busier, people are focused, we're getting head down, and we're doing that. But man, you have to still be aware of your markets, what's going on in your shop, what are you missing, what do you need to be working on? Um, you know, things like that, Marshall, is the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah. Well, I know um, the different shops that I've worked at or I visited or I co coached or consulted or whatever, right? Yep. You w take a tour and you see stuff all the time and people, a lot of times they're so head down, busy working that the most obvious things are missing. For example, they don't have enough screens reclaimed. Yeah. They're just sitting there in a pile. <laughs> yep. you know and then and then all of a sudden they go oh my god we need some screens right and it's this big emergency right or another situation could be um you know you're busy 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 and guess what that you haven't called a customer yeah it, you're at like in a year or two a right and, and because you're so busy doing things that you forget that you need to keep that relationship going. Absolutely. Right? Because you're only focused. You're like a horse with blinders on. You're just yep. focused on what's in front of you and you don't see the big picture. So what I really want everybody here to, to kind of look at is you need to have your head up. Your head needs to be on a swivel. You need to be looking around at what's going on and maybe you don't need to do that. For example, right now, maybe print on demand with DTG doesn't really fit into what you do, but you need to understand how it works, right? You might be having conversations with your customers to because maybe you could land, maybe they're going to be moving in that direction. And then, I'll, and if you're not talking about that, then how are you ever going to know? Yeah. Right. So you have to understand where this market is going. And yeah, yeah, you're a screen printer and I get it. You don't want DTG and all that kind of thing. But let me tell you, there's a huge chunk of this market that's moving that way. Yep. I right? um, and Whether you agree with it or not, at the end of the day, you're labeling yourself as a screen printer, not as an entrepreneur, not as a business person. Not as a garment decorator. Not as a garment decorator. You're right. So yeah. you're, are you missing the boat by not paying attention to this stuff, right? I'm not saying you got to go out and spend 60 grand on a new DTG press, right? If you haven't developed a market and you don't know what's going on, you just need to be aware of what's going on. That's the first step. And that's what I want, really want to get to is what's going on in your shop. What's going on in your marketplace? What's going on with your employees? Yep. 
You don't march. You know, that type of stuff. I want to touch on something you talked about. There's two things. One, you talk. You you made the analogy of the screen room. Of course, that got my heart going because that's well, that's I what live. you do, man. That's what I live. <laughs> and you know, for those of you that are screen printers and you get busy, we've all had that going. I have no screens made. The bot instead of looking at the problem and you didn't see the situational awareness, what do you do? I don't have time to reclaim. I don't have time to uh, get them coded. I'll do what I have to do to get through this, but I'll just buy more screens. Screens are equipment. Instead of going, why? Why am I not? Right. You know, why am I not? Don't have enough screens. What's the bottleneck yeah. in my reclaim in yeah. my drawing in my coding? Instead of looking at the big picture on there. And that happens all the time. I'm a shop where I have one manual and I have 800 screens. Yeah. Okay, exaggerating. But because they just don't have the time and they're not looking at the bottlenecks there. Yeah. And that's the situational awareness. And as we're getting busy, as things are coming up, it's things like that. Because that money you threw out buying more screens is just, okay, well, screens work, sure. But that cash, cash is still king. That has not changed. Yeah. Right. I was laughing because I had this mental picture. I knew this guy in college mm -hmm. who would never do laundry. He would just go buy more clothes. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and so that's what that made me think of it. That I triggered that memory. Yeah. Oh, exactly. um, so uh, Heather's here. Hey, Heather. Hey, Heather from Cave City, Kentucky. And then Christine says, Marshall is okay if I share the spreadsheet off. Oh, yeah. Please uh, email, email. I think we're talking later today, actually. I will. Uh, it remind me and I'll send you that spreadsheet. Um, Greg says, looking forward to next week. What I wish I knew before I started my decorated apparel business or why did I start my own business? I was too ignorant to know that I could not succeed. Bye. <laughs> so Greg has to leave. So what he's talking about, everybody, is next week we are going to have Mr. Greg Kitson on as a special guest. And man, um, you know, that's going to be the topic. What I wish I knew before I started my business. Um, you know, he's all about the profit cycle and doing that. I don't care if you're a small shop just getting started in any form of decorating to a large one. This is going to be gold. You're going to want yeah. to not miss this. Right, Share right. Telling people. Yeah. And then his next comment was uh, rule number one, tomorrow screens today. Oh, he's still uh, there. And I gave him accolades. <laughs> yeah, and like my thing is that the actual cool. I want tomorrow screens done uh, actually two days ago. I want yeah. it so when my production team wants to stage tomorrow, which should happen usually around mm -hmm. lunch. Okay, the screens are already there. Yep. Right? Which meant like the day before, which mm -hmm. today is Friday, would have been Wednesday. That's when those screens were made. Right. Yep. I know for a fact, because I've been in Greg's shop multiple, multiple times, what he talks about, he does. And every day, screens are done ahead of time. And that doesn't mean they're coded ahead of time. They are imaged, and they are exposed and washed out and ready to go. Ready to go. Mm -hmm. So yeah. every day, every yeah. time. Before yeah. that day ends, they're done. Right. It's great. And that's the way you got to be. You got to uh, mm -hmm. do it early. And you got to be, you got to know this, see that situational awareness, but you got to be intentional about it. Yeah, right, and right. they are. And so that, that, that's Greg, that's Rob, his right hand man. They have a great mm -hmm. staff there. So, yep. 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 Cool. All right. So, uh, please keep the comments coming on that. Absolutely. Let me ask you, uh, I'll ask you a question. If you're watching right now, what gets in the way of you being aware of what's going on in your shop? Yep in your marketplace with your employees or with your customers, what do you think is the roadblock? Yep. You know, for you, right. It, it just leave a comment and that way uh, maybe we can help you solve that. So right. uh, let's move to the third topic while we're waiting for people to answer. <laughs> right. All right. It's going to be top line versus bottom line. Oh man. What are we talking about here, Alan? Sales are great. Sales with no profit do not help. You know, we all want to be busy, but you want to be busy and being profitable and making money. And what's happening now is that we are getting busy. Things are open up. We're knuckling down, staying focused. 
but those jobs you're being busy on because we went so long and it's been very tiring year, we might just be grabbing anything and it is a business we really need. And are you making profit on it? Right. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> okay. We'll just leave that out there. Right. Yep, absolutely. Um, and uh, I've been talking uh, this past week with a couple shops <clears throat> and I ask them, Hey, what's, well, it's great that your sales were this, whatever the number is. I go, what, what's the profit on that? And uh, twice, two different shops. They told me they, they didn't know. Yep. They didn't know what their profit was. They didn't know what their margin was. They didn't know how to calculate it. And, and that's fine. That's why they're talking to me because I'm going to help them figure that out. But it's like one of these things where um, they don't know how to do it. They've been in business for a while. And uh, this is, they've come to realize that they need help strategizing this on how to really realize that. Uh, there's people out there right now in um, who are only focused on their top line goal, right? We want to get to 500,000. We want to get to a million. We want to get to 2 million, whatever their number is. Whatever in your brain is that next level amount, okay? And here's what they're not talking about, Alan, is like, what is the profit on that? Yeah. How do we know what the profit is on that? How do we build more profit on that, yeah. right? They're so focused on hitting that sales goal that they're not focused on the profit goal. And that's what I want to kind of dig in here. So my question for you guys watching is, do you, do you know what your profit is? How, what are you doing intentionally yep. to drive more profit? This could be in cost optimization. This could be how you handle your labor. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to raise your prices, mm -hmm. right? And so it's like there are strategies that you could be employing to make more profit, to be more profitable, yep. right? And are you doing that with intent all the time? That's my question for you guys. Um, so, Alan, what do you think about this? Well, what, what do you tell, tell your customers? It's always about profit. It's never about sales. Sales don't grow businesses. Profits grow businesses. I remember being very new in this industry, uh, late 80s, early 90s, and all of a sudden some monster huge companies went out of business. And I, I remember hearing the story. I don't know if it's true, but there were people at the door going, what do you mean the doors are locked out of business? We're way too busy to be out of business. Yeah. And that stuck with me where we yeah. can't be out of business. We're too busy. Busy right. does not mean profitable. Sales right. don't grow businesses. Profits grow business. And as a sales guy, you know, it, it's tough because we want sales. We want on there, but I've got to have profits. My company does not look at my sales as much as they do. They do. But we know where we're at, and we've got to be profit profitable on that sales, the small ones and the big ones. Um, profit, so it's yeah. all about that. Profit is not a dirty word. It's profit okay to make money. You know what? If you're, I say this, I talk about this when I'm doing seminars, even though it's it's on technical and it's on production. I make everybody. I want them to raise their hands. Are there any nonprofits in the in the in the uh, <laughs> you know in the audience there? No one. Okay, good. You're all in on it wanting to make profit. You know, you are not a nonprofit company. You have to look at profit. If you are, then just go get your 5013C and be a nonprofit. <laughs> you know, um, and I swear, I, I see companies and I have my whole career. We're going, and I, I always put this in a file of, we put these people in a file of, they're in business still in spite of themselves. I don't right. get how they've lasted that long. But, right. Well, there's there's to some degree of luck to, with some of this, right? And uh, guess what? When the when the luck runs out, you're you're in trouble. <laughs> or when what happens a year ago, the bottom drops out, they're the first ones to go. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I went out of business. Well, we do. Right. Because yeah, so, you're intentional. Yeah, and uh, I don't think anybody is going to post that they don't know how what or what their profit is, right? No. I don't. Uh, people have a hard time admitting that, um, but I can tell you there are tons of ways to be more profitable, and a lot of it has to do with efficiency. A lot of it has to do with 
How are you using your labor? How are you using your uh, mm -hmm. uh, workflow? Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's involved in that. And just thinking about what you do in a different way, uh, which is yep. a bigger conversation than we can have probably yep. on this show. But um, and I, I think, too, it's not a sin to n say to yourself going, I don't know how to figure that out. That's OK. Admitting it is the first step to recovery. Then yeah. reach out to Marshall. That's what he does. Invest in your company and learn how to do it and how to calculate it. It's OK if you don't know. Yeah. But, you know, because what is we're going to quote our guest next week, Mr. Greg Kitson. We just don't know what we don't know. That's right. okay. We want to post it now, but reach out to people that do know. It's the unknown known. Do not ask it on a Facebook message board. We won't even oh get it. Oh, my God. You will get hey. opinions. Yeah. Hey, uh, Alan, what's the best white ink? <laughs> my screen looks like crap. What is the problem? What, what are all these bumps? <laughs> Price hey. check. Price check. Hey, I got a two color and a white shirt. What, what should I charge? Oh God! Right. Don't ask yeah. questions on a message board. Don't get me started. All right. Oh, we can go nuts. So, Here's my thing: listen to people who know. Right. Find out. Nobody's untouchable. Make the phone call. Make the email. Just because they've been in business for thirty years doesn't mean they know what they're doing. They could be psychomaniacs for thirty years. <laughs> so, and they are a lot of them. Hey, uh, Eric with Actions watching today. Hey, uh, Eric, how you doing? Good morning. Uh, Peter says, consciously competent shops succeed. Absolutely. Good job, Peter. I like that. Uh, Daryl says, time management. Yep. Top line equals ego. Bottom line equals survival. Perfect. Right. Everything is absolutely fantastic. We're busier than ever. All uh, we now are orders. That's good. Glad to hear it. Hey, Eric, how is uh, the the wall that Charlie helped you develop selling? Which is, I'm very curious about that. Yeah. And if you haven't seen that, that's kind of a uh, a thing you put in your screen to keep the ink flowing behind the squeegee and the flood bar. I'm very curious to how that's going. Can, Eric, can you share what's up with that? Um, I'd like to know. And I believe, Marshall, that is basically designed, and Charlie's on here too, so Charlie, you can yeah. chime in also. I believe that is a uh, uh, for water base mostly, if I remember right. Yeah, just I'm just curious as yeah. to, are, are people adopting that? What are you doing? All that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Um, and then, uh, where are we? My, my, my comment shifted. Um, oh, Mark. here it is. Mark says, what does your equipment cost you while sitting idle? <laughs> right? Why is it sitting idle? So, one of the things that I talk a lot about with my coaching clients is I want you to consider what that press, that embroidery machine, that heat press, that DTG press, whatever it is, that piece of equipment, what is the value of that in sales per hour, right? Not what does it cost you, but what can you be making when that thing is running? You know, is it $300 an hour, $400 an hour, $1,000 an hour? So when that thing isn't churning, right, what does it cost you per minute? For every minute that that thing isn't running, that's potential money down the drain. And that's a great way of thinking about that. And then when I talk to shops a lot for like, let's just say an auto press, right, I, I like using $300 an hour, which to me is a little low, but yep. it's easy conversation math because that's $5 a minute. So if I'm standing there in your shop, right, I'm standing there in your shop, right, I want you to think about every minute that that press isn't printing, I'm taking a $5 bill out of my wallet and I'm throwing it on the floor. Actually, it's your, yep. it's your money, right, on yep. the floor. At the end of the day, does it look like an autumn leaf pile of $5 <laughs> bills? Because a lot of shops it does, right? Yeah. That's the cost of your downtime. Absolutely. How come you're not profitable? It's that, <laughs> right? Yep. What is preventing you from making more money? That, right? That's what we're talking about here. So, uh, Greg says, optimal customer selection. Be picky when you choose to who to work with. Exactly. Yep. Brian says, I didn't come here for this abuse. 
You invited <laughs> it by coming here. Yeah. 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 Who invited you? <laughs> hey, you were invited. You're we're glad you're here. Patient. Yep. COVID had me refocus to work smarter, not harder. So my sales are down, obviously, but my profit margins have increased. Things are picking up fast, but I have really changed the jobs I want to do. It was a hard look at the 80-20. Exactly, Keith. Exactly. Glad to hear it. Good job. Marshall, let's talk about it. He mentions the 80-20, and you were talking about our last topic with situational awareness, where mm -hmm. you uh, shared about a client that yeah, yeah. Their, so, their largest, one of their largest customer, they just lost sales on. Yeah, so I, I'm working with a new shop and I had them do the 80-20 exercise. I had them pull the last five years of sales and they sent it to me. And then I sorted it by each year and I sorted it by the amount of money that the customer spent. And uh, what I noticed was after this one year, a huge chunk of sales just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. They just weren't there. And wow. so on my next call, I asked, well, hey, what happened? And I go, my assumption is your salesperson left. And they go, yeah, that's exactly what happened. I go, okay, how come you haven't engaged with these clients? And what I did is I made the all the cells on the spreadsheet pink where they had no sales. And it was just, it was just this incredible amount of color. And I go, you need to go after these folks with it, with just a lot of effort and just re-engage and just with empathy and just ask, Hey, how you doing? What's going on with you? Uh, just to find out what's, what's up. Right. And they're missing a huge chunk of their sales because they haven't been engaging with them. And I yep. think an 80-20 look is a great way of doing that. So just go to QuickBooks or Printavo or Shopworks or whatever you use, right? And dial that up, get the last five years of sales, and then sort it by customer, by dollar amount. And of course, this isn't profit. You can you should do that too. But by looking at, are people dropping off the map, right? Yep. And then this is going to help you re-engage with them. So you should be doing that now. Um, and that really hurts if it's uh, if it's in your 80-20, where if you don't know what the 80-20 is, that's where 80% of your business is usually 20% of your clients. Yep. And when you have that top 20 there, and it could be in sales, if if it's also your top 20 in sales and in profit, and you they drop off, boy, you're going to feel that. Yeah, right, right. If and they're then, top uh, in sales and they're very low profit, you might want to let them go. Yeah, William says it's not how much money you handle, it's how much you keep. Yep. It's great. And then Greg says, asset utilization is what the CPAs and investors will ask when you try to value your business. Excellent point, Greg. Very Thank good. you. Thank you. I can't wait till next week when Greg's on. All right. So where are we? All right. So we're down to the last topic. Let's go. Okay. And it's this one. Get to. That's right. That's and right. And this comes from this book. I want everybody to go buy this book right now. You can buy it for like $3, $6 or something on Amazon. Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Yep. Okay. And I want you to learn the reason why you need to get to That's Right. And Alan, you're in sales, right? Supposedly. How important is it to hear no Yes, or that's right. Talk about that real quick. Well, I've said that no is the best word to hear for me because if someone tells me no, I don't waste my time. No is great. It's definitive. It's right there. Move on. And, you know, when, you have, when you're a new guy, I remember when I was very young, when I first started, I hated hearing the word no because I keep, keep banging on the doors, keep, and you should always stay in touch, but keep trying to break through. Well, he's already said no. Move on. Don't waste your time. Get moving. No is okay. What I want to hear is not yes. I want to hear that's right or you got it. That's You're right on. Something like that. Mm -hmm. That is the buying signal that I have connected with them and they know there's no other way. Right. I hear that's right. You know, that's, that's, that's not just a buying signal. That's right there. We have it. Move forward. Start going in for the close. What do we have to do? And, and I hate the word close because it's such a cliche. But right now as a partner going, what do we have to do to keep moving into that direction and do it? Yeah, so the book really outlines a really great way to focus on how to do this kind of stuff.
-hmm. which is where you set up uh, the scenarios by mirroring or labeling right. the other person, how they are thinking and how they're talking. And what you want to get to is that person to say, you know what? You're right. That's right. Right. Yep. And uh, and um, not just a no or a yes, but they're agreeing that this is the proper way of doing it. And if you can't frame that, you know, they also talk about the, the best phrase is to use is, well, how am I supposed to do that? Yep. How am I supposed to do that? That doesn't make sense for me. And that could be about working for less than you want to or some minimum, you know, not reaching the minimum order or, or whatever. How am I supposed to do that? Right. And so you want to get to that's right. Uh, and it, it's a really effective tool. And I highly recommend this book. Um, you know, I've had it for a while. Uh, I was traveling last week. Uh, you know, that's why Alan was here. And this is the book I brought on the plane, even though. Alan, I've got a whole stack of new books that I haven't read. I didn't bring one of those. I brought the one that I've already read, and I'm rereading it. And because sometimes rereading things. I haven't even started yet. Oh, great. Oh. Right. Oh, and Daryl, he actually took Chris Voss's course. He says, killer book. Ah, and hot take summarize what the other person says equals empathy. Exactly. Absolutely. It proves that you're listening. It's active listening. Yep. So uh, thank you for those comments, Daryl. Appreciate you. Um, so I, I really recommend this book. And uh, I just sent it to one of my coaching clients uh, the other day because mm -hmm. uh, they're doing some negotiating and I just want them to be able to have a good tool. Right. So, Yep. I think that the thing that um, works the most in these situations is really, um, at, like Daryl said, is the empathy, is mirroring them, it's understanding them, it's having them feel like you're really, you know, you know personal, it's human to human, that you're listening. The mirroring thing always confused me a little bit because if you, some people call it mirroring, some people call it mimicking. If you over exaggerate it, then you're just making fun of them. No, but you see, you say, "Oh, uh, mirroring is confusing." Well, I've heard of mirroring and mimicking because of you know a, a tone and stuff they do. Now, if they're quieter, then you bring your voice down. I'm it's, well, hold on. It's it's a tone that you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> like that. Well, stop it. I'm <laughs> doing it to you, pal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. And it, it is, it's more of asking the question. So one of the things I do in sales and it's, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever been through the Sandler selling system. It was right. in the 90s, so I did. But one of the things I always brought out is one, I'm not afraid to talk about price. Find out what their budget is. Get that out of right. the way. You need, to get, you need to understand what that is because that sets, that really helps you understand. Because if you know that this is all I can spend, that's my yep. budget. That's going to help you affect what shirt Absolutely. you use, how many colors, how many locations. Before that. that, though, you better know what their pain point is. What is their pain? Where is it at? And what are they looking for on there? Then you find out what their budget is to create that. But then you start talking because if you're not going to get to that's right until you know what the problem is, they can buy anything from anybody. Right. So, yeah. And I, maybe I'm, you know, the mirroring thing is different than, you know, I, I know some people talk about, um, and I will use this. And if you ever see me at a show, um, so this is, I say it's because it's for the weak minded. I do it. Um, everybody That's knows. right up my alley. Oh, I'm right there. It's like the general <laughs> mind trick only works on the weak, my, my, weak minded. So I had a, a company I worked for, told one of the junior sales guys, watch Alan. So I grew up in Michigan. I'm from Detroit. So I have this little bit of a Northern thing accent, I guess. I don't realize it. Here's what most people don't realize until it's there. So my mom, my grandparents who raised me are from the deep south. Hills of Alabama, Russellville, you know, south of there up in Bankhead National Forest. My father is from the East Coast. He's from New York. So when I worked for Tech Support Screen Printing Supplies, Bill Redeker realized and told me, he goes, do you know that your accent changes from where the trade shows are? When we're in Atlantic City, I have an East Coast thing that comes out. And I can talk right with them. I don't realize I'm doing it. He goes, when we went to the Nashville show, I heard a Southern drawl that I've never heard you do before. Hey, y'all. 
Oh, well, it's not, I can't even do it by doing it. But if I'm around people and my family down there, right. it just comes out naturally on sure. there. And, you know, he, they, someone, he asked me, he goes, because that sales technique of it's called mimicking and stuff. And I said, I don't realize I'm doing it. Right. So, but there, maybe that's where I was like, don't try that unless you, because you could look like you're making fun of people. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing to do is part of the mirroring thing is, is you repeat it back and you say, it seems like it True. looks like I heard this and you're just showing them that this is, this is where we are with it. Right. Our, yeah. It seems like you're telling me this. Da, da, da. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. And right. that I think that comes from what Daryl said of empathy on there. I'm repeating back. We're on the same page. You're saying, OK, wait. So that navy blue is w way too dark. It's almost black. That's right. OK, got it. We need to we need to move to a different shade. And you are just confirming what they're saying. Mm -hmm. and getting right to that point where you're now not a salesperson, you're a partner. It always right. comes out of the partnership with me. Sure. Right. Cool. Yep. Hey, uh, Daryl says he's got to go. Thanks for the program. Happy Easter. You too, buddy. You too. Um, all right. So where are we at here? We got about five minutes left. Um, so let's talk about uh, this weekend. Let's talk about next week. So what do you got on the, on the table there, Alan? What are you doing? Well, this week I've been traveling a lot. This week uh, I am <laughs> I am actually going to go to the fish farm tomorrow and uh, get fish for my uh, my stepmom and my father. Um, I still call it my dad's place, even though he passed away in December uh, for their pond. And you know, it's my job. I keep the fish the pond stocked well. So, so you're buying live fish to stock the pond. Yes. Do you so, buy like the little fingerlings? Is that what you uh, do? And some of them. So they'll they'll be perched. They'll be crappie. Bass will come in a couple weeks, and they're a certain size and stuff. Uh, I always put a couple uh, pounds of uh, minnows in there. Um, you know, there's always a little bit of a die-off. So I'm going to the fish farm. Of course, today is Good Friday. Sunday I'll be at church for Easter. Um, usually we get together as our family at my um, uh, my dad and stepmom's place for mm -hmm. a big uh, um, breakfast and stuff. Yeah. We're Did doing you the ham with the pineapple and the whole deal? Uh, no, uh, my stepmom, Kathy, is uh, Polish. Uh, so it is a great breakfast. It's a couple kinds of uh, good Polish sausage. It is, um, it's right. Kishkid stuff. Here you go. Like Mark, that. Mark says, leg of lamb and ham on the smoker. Thanks, so I'm going to be flying to Texas and I'm going to hang out with him. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so we'll get together next week. My brother and his family are out of town. They're on vacation in Florida and Destin. So we'll all do that next week. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to redo some grass seed in my lawn. So I'm going to enjoy the weekend. Even though it snowed a couple days, if you saw my displeasure on Facebook. I, I did make fun of you, I believe. And I asked you, why are you being so hateful? <laughs> um, so while it was snowing yesterday, uh, it actually will be like almost 70 degrees on Monday. Mm -hmm. Sunday, Monday. So yeah, so that's what I got going on. Uh, yeah, so my my son's off from school today, uh -huh. and later today he's got like eight or nine of his friends coming over, yeah, and yeah. we're leaving. <laughs> so we're we're going over to my in law's house, uh, my brother in law and sister in law's house for dinner. Yeah, and uh, so and I got to do that. I'm leaving uh, Monday morning. I got to go to Kentucky, back on the road. Man, I have been doing more with uh, auto reclaims, you know, from MRs to yeah. Impros and, Lot and Lotus Hollands. Uh, just it's just been fun. So uh, yeah, I, I like everybody investing in the auto reclaim. That seems like a really popular thing right now. And I think he used like it feels like to me, Alan, and maybe I'm wrong, that people were getting into the direct to screen like a couple of years ago. It seems like that was the really right. hot thing. And now I think everybody's looking to the reclaim part of that process more than direct to screen. It could, does that seem like the same way to you? I mean, it, it, just, it, it is um, one they've all became. And I always, I always liken it. You know, I'm, I'm a guy who's situ almost situational. I think about things that happened before. 
So I'm going to give a shout out to MNR. I remember when MNR came out with the gauntlet. Now that's mm -hmm. how old I am. And to me, you're that, old. Oh, I ancient. Uh, <laughs> that was the first automatic in my mind that became affordable to the medium. You didn't have to be a huge shop. Yeah. And that kind of burned it from there. Cause before then it was American centurions and stuff. And right. you had a monster, huge shop. Not everybody had that. Well, now automatics are commonplace. It wasn't always like that. Um, you know, direct to screen. I remember when the first ones came out and stuff, they became, the technology improved, they became more user-friendly, and they became affordable, one to the medium-sized shop, and, uh, and then the shops that are actually looking at their labor. So now everybody, you know, whether it's an eye image, whether it's a, a wax jet, something like that from Dowfit, Everybody's looking, or from Exile, or there, there's a bunch of them out there. And right. we're all looking, they're all looking at ROI and labor. So it's not a new product anymore. With Auto Reclaim, it's the same thing. It used to be these monster huge machines out of Europe. They were mostly in the graphic market because you had a 15-foot screen and just moving them around were brutal. Right. There was a lot of chemical and the bigger the, I always go, the bigger the machine for stuff like that, the bigger the chemical eaters are. And machines were always chemical eaters. It's ke chemical right. companies bought them. But yeah. now technology has become, one MNR has made it, you need to do three to 500 screens, you're looking at an MNR on there. Their controls on adjusting chemical and dwell, there's a lot of things on there. I think there's other ones, the Impros and the Lotus for a smaller market machine. They don't overlap. It's what do you need? And, you know, as somebody that sells chemical for them, we're not connected to any of them. We have great relationships with, with some uh, on there. I know we have an awesome relationship with MNR and we appreciate mm -hmm. it. But you know what? Ours just work better. And the machine companies are finding out going, you know what? Uh, uh, and actually, Peter, I'm going to dime you out right here. I heard through a <laughs> show a few years ago, uh, he was telling me, he goes, yeah, Peter Walsh said, I don't, you know, as an M&R guy, he, they don't care what chemical you use in their machine. But he actually said, he goes, I don't know what kind of magic dust Easy Way puts in. It just works better. Right. And, and I now know what the magic dust is. I'm not allowed to say Alex and John Schluter implants this with a, it's like scanners. If I mention it, my head explodes. But, um, you know, I think the market has got there. COVID has actually accelerated that where the things that have been buying still, people are always looking at auto coders, uh, direct to image and auto reclaim. Those are the equipment that have been selling because they are labor savings. It's not about chemical. Yep. It's about plus, cl plus cleaning screens. It's like you're doing dishes all day. Nobody wants that job. And in a lot of shops, I, I've been to a gazillion shops, and they always seem to, I don't know why, the worst employees work right. in the screen room. It's like a punishment job more than anything. Yeah. Rather than having the most, you know, anal process person in the screen room, which yeah. is what I would want. And it's because you the screens you come out have to be perfect. Why would you put your worst employee in there, right? Absolutely. So if you give them a better tool, you can get a better result out of it. So I was in a shop in Arizona uh, last week. They got their first auto reclaim. And the guy who was reclaiming the screens, he is now the screen manager. And basically said, this is his baby. And I said, mm -hmm. never, never treat it bad. Just rub it with a diaper every day. <laughs> you know, it's like a car off, car off a Ferris Bueller. Because right. he knows if it goes down, it's not taken care of. He's back to doing it by hand. Right, right. He can now do in a few hours what took him all day. Right. And now he's more available to the company because now he's he's not just reclaiming. He is in charge of their screen room. They're moving it all in there. And he's he's now imaging screens. He's He is right. now the screen room manager. And that's what it needs to be. Right. All right. So Peter says, uh, thanks for another great show. Be well. And then because you talked about him, he goes, how big will the automatic squeegee and flood bar washer be for multi automatic press shops? You tell me, Peter. Well, I don't here's here's I, the I, thing that, that 
you know, the shops that I ran, you know, it was like 16 autos, you know, it was a fairly decent size. We use the, um, the Aussie clean system, which is bioremediation, right, right. right? And I'm a big proponent of that. So if you guys, m and you're interested in that, I would be looking at that bioremediation stuff because um, it does the process great. It lowers the VOCs. Uh, and, um, you, your, uh, the, the byproduct is, um, you know, CO2 and water, right? Well, so there isn't like a whole lot of, uh, fuss well, with it. And I, that's what I always liked. And it was, and it really saved a lot of costs in the shop. But Marshall, what Peter's talking about now is a more automated one. The Aussie clean is still manual labor right. on it. He's talking about how big will the automatic squeegee and flood bar washer be for multi-automatic press washes. So the way to yeah. do it now, it's still some sort of Aussie clean and a washout booth yeah, and a right. like that. So one of the, pro I think big, Peter, because it's still an issue. Uh, I've been in shops in Chicago, some in Michigan. They're going, how do I clean squeegee and flood bars to get them going? One, how, you know, I've seen dishwasher machines where people put them in there. They have an attachment and it gets them some. One, it has to work. Two, Marshall, you're right. VOCs are huge, especially if you're in California, some counties in Wisconsin. You've got to look at that. And that comes down to the chemistry. Yeah. And there are good chemical companies such as, I don't well, know. But there's that one squeegee cleaning with that, that the crank thing, right? Yeah. But that's still manual. They're yeah. talking, it goes into a machine like that. I think big, it's got to work. Yeah. Because there's a lot of them out there that don't work and it's got to be affordable. Because, yeah, if, if money's no object, it's easy to create something. But we've got to put an yeah. ROI with it, and you've got sure. to have a value to it. And that yeah. will, I think that could be the next big thing in screen, in screen cleaning. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, we should be talking to Peter about that. <laughs> you know, I, I wish we've invited Peter on the show, but we have. Yeah, Peter, come on, jump on the show, be a guest. We can have a I'm dime you out now again. Come on, Peter, I know you're busy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, hey, we're over time a little bit, so uh, everyone well, hold, hold have on, a fantastic. Hold on, Peter just posted. What? Peter just posted. Oh, what do you say? Oh, here you go. Um, six minutes cycle time, twenty-four total squeegees or floods clean with closed loop chemistry. Then final freshwater rinse ready for the rack or back on press. That's I'm pretty good. Is this something that's over. on the market now, Peter? Or are you like you're developing it? Let us know. I want to look at it. I, I believe I may or may not have seen a prototype. Yeah. And then uh, Mark says, number one has to work. Alan for the win. Yeah. We've seen a lot of things out there. There's been a lot of things that's happened. And now everything needs to be refined where it works. I think yeah. auto reclaim, it's not about will it work? It will. Um, auto reclaim, it's not a matter, it's not a matter if uh direct the screen works. It does. It's not yeah. a matter if you have to ask if it works, you're you, you don't need one. Yeah. It, you know, auto reclaim it works. Now, sometimes machines, my thing are machines don't have eyes. You better have the right products in there because I just spent a couple of weeks with you know switching product out, going, I don't know why ours works better. It just does. Yeah, right. It's all about all right. efficiencies. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Well, let's wrap it up. So everyone have a happy Easter weekend. Uh, stay safe. And we'll catch you next week with who's our guest again? Mr. Greg Kitson from Mind's Eye Graphics. So I'm excited. So excited. So excited about that. And Marshall, we got a lot of cool things coming up too. It's going to be fun yeah. here. We do. We do. All right. Everyone have a great weekend and we'll catch you next week. And in the meantime, if you want that spreadsheet, email me Marshall at MarshallAtkinson.com and we will talk to you soon. Thanks everyone. Well, See you.